Good afternoon, everyone. This is Christine Malvin with the Health Path Foundation of Ohio, and I would like to welcome you today to our From the Front of a Room, Creating a Supervisor, Survivor, sorry, Survivor-Centered Media Response. Um, this is the first in a series of webinars that the Health Path Foundation is going to be hosting that is related to our Community Connections Initiative for this year. As many of you know, we um, funded storytelling grants, and since HealthPath um, funds and supports projects around family violence prevention, working with survivors to tell their stories is very important to many of our grantees and to the community in general that we serve. Um, this is one of three that we're working with the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence on. Um, we're also going to be doing one on December 8th, um, a similar session to this, but looking at it from the Arabic culture, and then one on December 11th, working, looking at it from the Hispanic culture. Um, so these are going to be really, really good. Um, we found the National Resource Center's toolkits um, on this topic and have worked with them to create this webinar. Because I know some people like to go through a toolkit, and some people like to listen and learn and ask questions. So we have the best of both worlds now. Um, we're also doing a webinar on December 2nd on working with vulnerable populations. How do you um, earn trust? How do you keep that relationship going, especially when you're working with people who have mental illnesses or substance use issues? Um, so these first ones that we're doing here in November and December are kind of um, around that same theme, working with um, specific populations. And then starting in January, we're going to be doing some more that are based, that are more communications focused with Idealware. So how do you use video, photos, how do you um, do an email newsletter, and things like that. So we're going to get started off by um, talking about the storytellers that you'll be working with and how to work best with them. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Casey Keene. Um, oh, one, one, sorry, one more thing. Um, if you have a question, most of you are on mute, and it doesn't look like anybody's um, really called in. There's a few people on the phone. So if you have a question, please um, type your questions in the question box, and then we'll pause periodically through the presentation to answer those questions. So, Okay, Casey, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Christine, and I'm so happy to be with all of you today. Um, for our discussion about creating survivor-centered responses to domestic violence. Um, my name is Casey Keene, and I'm the Online Resources and Education Manager here at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, um, where I've been for, um, it'll be 13 years this year. Um, I also am a survivor speaker, and so I will be kind of sharing pieces of my own experience as we talk today, um, and hopefully you'll be able to draw on that as you uh, do your own work in helping to amplify survivors' stories. So today we'll provide an overview of issues that face survivors who want to speak publicly about their experience. Um, we'll talk about how to navigate those issues in order to best help survivors tell their stories in a way that feels safe and healing and impactful. We'll also talk about the value of incorporating survivor stories into different events or through different media channels, and we're, we'll explore key considerations for doing that. So first, I'd like to start by sharing a piece of my own story. Um, I do want to make a note that I will be using some profanity in order to honestly reflect the true dialogue um, of the situation. Um, so please bear with me as I do so. We were all sitting down for a family dinner. As Roger's wife, cooking dinner every night was one of mom's duties. She did this with precision, the same way she did all of her household duties. It didn't take much for Roger to get angry. I suppose that's an understatement. Let me rephrase by saying that Roger searched for any excuse to be angry. He kept a hawk eye on every move that was made. He let nothing pass and no slip-up was small enough for him to overlook. And so we sat at the dinner table. Even my 11-year-old eyes could detect the darkness that had begun to surround us. It was a vibe that shook your body still. It was a silence that screamed in your head. Our plates were complete with meat, potatoes, and vegetables. The serving bowl stood evenly spaced in the middle of the table. The meat was sliced and garnished on its pewter serving platter. 
The peas were fresh from the garden and steaming in their casserole dish. The mashed potatoes sat in a heavy green crockery bowl, a pat of butter melting a neat hole in its center, and freshly cut parsley flakes strewn about the top. A basket of warm rolls was lined with a clean cloth. Each glass was filled with cold milk. There were folded cloth napkins in each place setting that were held by pewter rings. Two candles burned at either end of the table. Everything was in order, and everything was color-coordinated. But something was wrong, and we all knew it. We just didn't know yet what Mom had done wrong this time. Liz and I ate carefully. We didn't speak unless spoken to. We crossed our legs at the ankles. We kept our elbows off the table. There was a comment about the meal. Roger said that he was sick of eating shit. We continued to eat. And then we started pushing the peas onto our forks with our fingers. And that was the event that broke the blackness in the air. Roger told Mom that her girls had disgusting eating habits. We were not to play with our food by helping our peas onto our forks. He couldn't bear to watch it anymore. And Mom defended us. She said that we were just kids. She said that we hadn't done anything wrong. And Roger picked up his plate, still full with the meal that Mom had taken great pains to prepare just right. In one swoop, he threw the plate at the wall. It shattered and peas went rolling. Will burst into tears. Roger burst into a fit of anger. He began screaming at Mom, You're worthless! You can't even get a meal right, and that's all you have to do all day, you fucking cunt. Mom scrambled to pick up the food in the broken glass. She yelled for me to take the kids upstairs. I stared at her in shock. Now, she yelled as the tears began to fill between Roger's obscenities. I took the baby and told Liz to come with me. We went up to the bedroom and turned up the radio. We stared at each other as I tried to calm the baby. It had happened again. It was almost the same story every night. The only difference was the excuse he used to justify his violent rage. But this time his excuse was us. He used us a lot as time went by. It was the only way he knew that he would get a reaction from Mom anymore. She had stopped standing up for herself because she had lost the will. But she would never stop standing up for her children. So there's power in hearing the stories of survivors. And it truly is a gift. It's a gift to be able to see, even if just a glimpse or just for a moment, a window into the experiences of survivors. Um, Bell Hooks refers to speech as a birthright, and the right to voice and authorship a privilege. Today, we'll explore the value in survivor storytelling and offer tips for harnessing the power of survivor's stories. So this presentation is based, as Christine said, on the two-part guide published by the NRC, which is now available in English, Spanish, and Arabic from the front of the room. You can download this guide and related materials at vonat.org. So here at the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, we developed this guide because we recognize that including the voices of survivors is critical to our work. Many survivors want to speak out but may need support and guidance in doing so, and many advocates want to support survivors in speaking out, but may need help in thinking through the considerations. Lastly, we at the NRC hear from survivor speakers who want to make an impact, and so these guides help us um, find the language and the resources and the considerations in doing so. We have learned that successful events come from careful planning related to both safety and support for survivors. So there's a number of reasons why a survivor might share their story. Um, first of all, and I think most importantly, it can be a healing experience and a restorative process for survivors themselves. Um, it, it's helpful for them to be able to voice the truth and to be able to demonstrate their own resilience and their own survival strategies. They also may share in hopes of preventing others from having a similar experience. Some may be on a quest to seek justice. Um, where perhaps they did not find justice themselves and hope that others may. They may want to foster change within society, um, and they may want to improve services of systems and the various system responses. And lastly, they may want to honor or, or do it in memory of somebody whose life has been lost. 
when it comes to resilience, um, Sherry Hamby, who's a researcher many of you may be familiar with, she focuses on the impacts of violence and the power of resilience specifically. And she has said, resilience is strengthened by recognizing that we are all experts in our own lives and we all have something to share with others. She wrote this article for Psychology Today in which she describes three key benefits for survivors specific to building resilience. One is finding your voice. One survivor says, the last one was a gateway for me. I owned it. I was no longer a victim. I was a survivor. One is reaffirming your own values. A survivor says, being able to put in words what's valuable to me is very important and a reminder, sort of, of how I should be living my life. And a third uh, element is finding peace and hope. One survivor says, I got closure and I let go of the anger. It was like a chapter that was being closed and I started planning for my future. More than their value to survivors, survivor stories are also valuable to all of us. Um, they can be unique and meaningful. They help us understand how stories, although they often share a common thread, are very complex and very unique to one another. Survivors' perspectives may be different from that of those of us who work in this field, um, but they're not any less valuable. And many survivors uh, do work in the field. Survivors sharing their personal experiences can take a significant emotional toll, something that we'll explore a little bit later on in this presentation. And the toll is not only on themselves, but often on their family, their friends, and also on the listening audience. Um, survivor stories can help us greatly by helping us improve our services, our policies, our response. Um, they're really key to the work that we do. So this leads us to a new term, survivor speaker, which includes any person who wishes to speak out and share how domestic or sexual violence has impacted their lives, their family, or their community. Um, this is a diverse group. Survivors represent all kinds of populations. Um, for example, survivors might be um, adult survivors of domestic violence. They may be children exposed, and that's the way I identify. Um, they may be a victim of elder abuse or neglect. They may be a surviving family member of somebody who's been lost um, because of domestic violence, homicide. Um, and they may be a family member impacted by a loved one's sexual assault. In this photo, we see Tom Reed sharing the story of how his niece's victimization impacted his family and motivated him to address sexual assault. So if you're not familiar with the No More campaign, I want to share this with you as they do offer an online space for survivors and others impacted by domestic or sexual violence to speak out. Um, this universal symbol helps us to say no more to domestic violence and sexual assault and no more to the misperceptions and the secrecy around this experience. You can visit their website to download their toolkit, upload your own photos to the gallery, access their print and PSA materials that are fully customizable, and most importantly, to take action to speak out and, and about the ways that domestic or sexual violence has touched your life and why it matters to you. Hey, Casey, I know um, Dottie Kane up in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, they're actually, their grant was to use the No More campaign up in that area. So there's a couple people on the call who are very familiar with that, with that campaign. Oh, wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. There's so many benefits to getting behind that symbol. It can be so powerful and, you know, the hope is that it'll be a symbol people recognize, you know, and, and that they can um, immediately identify uh, the movement with that symbol. So thank you for your work in doing that. Let's see. So there's a wide range of opportunities for survivors who wish to share their stories. They can present to community groups. They can speak before state and local programs. They can participate in magazine, television, newspaper interviews, either by um, noting their name or anonymously. They can join different um, events that may be happening around Domestic Violence Awareness Month, like candlelight vigils, marches, rallies, 
um, even memorial events for victims. Um, sometimes there can be um, local 5Ks or other kinds of walks or things like that um, in memory of those who have lost their lives. Um, they could be part of a program's fundraising event or other efforts. They can talk with the board of directors and leadership uh, to help improve program design and provision of services. Um, some survivors may agree to have their story included in an organization's annual report or publication. Uh, quotes or stories from survivors can really drive, help us to drive home points about um, ways that we know survivors experience violence and how they can be helped. Um, they can also speak at empowerment groups for survivors that are part of the program, like skills development groups, parenting classes, asset building workshops. I know recently um, I heard from a survivor who identified as a child exposed, um, who talked to um, kids at a shelter um, about her own experience and her own strength in surviving. Um, so that ties into providing encouragement during, during victim support group. They could be featured as a keynote speaker at a conference or other DVIM event. And they can share stories in social media, on webinars, or a variety of other web-based platforms. And we'll be exploring some of the considerations for those. So for additional campaign ideas and tools to support your efforts in carrying out successful awareness events, uh, you can visit the website of the Domestic Violence Awareness Project at nrcdv.org slash dvam. So this is where I want to just pause and ask Christina if any questions come in, and if not, we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. Um, nothing's come up so far. Nope, okay. we're good so far. Great. So just a reminder that if you have any questions or thoughts um, that you'd like to share, so please go ahead and, and type those in the question box for Christine. So how can advocates help? What is the role of the advocate in helping survivors to share their stories? There, um, you, can, you can help by including survivors in planning how their stories will be shared. So one of the most important things you can do is help, help a survivor visualize a successful event. Help them get centered. Help them identify which aspects of their story are important to share. Um, you want to tell the survivor about the audience, about who's going to be represented there, um, especially if there may be audiences that are particularly challenging. And I'll share some of my own experience with that soon, because I have run into some challenging audiences. Um, you'll want to plan for audience interaction. Um, it's a very common experience for a survivor to uh, share their story in front of an audience that um, often has judgment about their story um, and may maybe not even intentionally um, say victim-blaming things. Um, and so you'll want to plan around that in such a way that you know what will happen if those things come up and that you have a plan. Um, and you'll also, it's very important to support survivors' self-care and healing during this process, um, during, you know, before the event, during the event, and after. So advocates can help uh, survivors identify the kinds of events that would be appropriate for sharing their own story, including what social media um, platforms might be best for them. And I do want to share this resource that we came across in our work um, that's available at witness.org. This is called uh, Conducting Safe, Effective, and Ethical Interviews with Survivors of Sexual and Gender-Based Violence. Um, this is part of Witness's video for change, uh, a how-to series on filming safely, effectively, and ethically. So specifically created for journalists um, and filmmakers. Um, it really is also a helpful tool for activists and activists um, who are conducting interviews with survivors. They share information and considerations on using survivor stories, how they should be presented, tips for evaluating safety and security needs, 
um, ways to prep a survivor for their interview, um, and a discussion on language and informed consent and um, steps to take following the interview. So it's a very detailed guide, a very helpful video that might be worth checking out. And I do want to note here with regard to language used, um, I did note before I shared my, my, a bit of my story that I used profanity. Um, when considering whether or not to use profanity in the survivor story, uh, you may want to consider it can be a helpful strategy for painting a really accurate picture of their survivor's experience and can often hit home um, for, for those who have not had the experience of surviving domestic violence to get a sense of, of you know, the language that's used and really the atmosphere of fear um, that they're experiencing. So these are the kinds of considerations um, that you want to help survivors think through. Advocates can also help explore survivors' readiness to tell their story. So there's a lot of questions that you'll want to consider with survivors around safety. So is it safe to share my story publicly? Um, what are the dangers that are out there? Is my is, it, there's there, is there a possibility that the abuser or the abuser's family may show up at the event? Um, is there the possibility that you know, putting that information out there may have some negative repercussions? Do I really want to share my story or am I feeling that I should? Is there pressure on the survivor to share their story from one place or another, whether it's from um, advocates themselves or maybe from the survivor's family? Um, it's really important to get to the bottom of what are the survivor's reasons for wanting to share their story um, when determining readiness. Um, and then who could help them figure that out? Um, you need to draw on all the resources that the survivor may have um, in order to, to help answer that question because really it's best if the survivor is sharing their story really because they have a desire to do so. Um, also, has the survivor talked with their children and loved ones uh, to understand how telling their story might impact them? And how do I feel about their response? Um, so depending on the relationships that you have, is it important um, that these people um, in your family and circle of friends or in your community, is it important to get their buy-in to share in order to share your story? Um, how you have to consider how uh, people may be presented, uh, those people who are key players in your own story, whether that is um, maybe the role of a church, maybe the role of um, a faith leader, um, you know, there's all kinds of players who may be instrumental in the telling of a story that you'll want to uh, consider how the story might impact them. And are there ongoing risks from the person that abused me? Is the survivor currently living in danger um, or could raising this story um, in a public setting expose them or you know, cause them to be vulnerable to danger again? So I'll tell you a little bit about what the process was like for me of deciding to share my story. When I was a teenager, um, I started writing down my story. I was actually taking a um, creative writing class in undergraduate school. And the assignment was to write a piece of nonfiction. And I thought about, you know, what, what could I write about? What, what did I know? And one of the things that always, you know, I felt very passionate about was about um, domestic violence, given my experience and the experience of my mother. And so I thought maybe it would be helpful and a good time to just start writing those things down. I was lucky enough to have kept a diary since the age of six, and so I had actually documented a lot of the abuse that I, ex that I witnessed and experienced. And so I went back to those diaries and I went back through photos and I tried to draw on pieces of my memory that um, much of which had been lost. And in doing so, I, I would call my mom and I would say, hey, do you remember this happening? Did this really happen? Did it happen this way? And so I started piecing it together. And what I did was I, I wrote it as a book and I gave it to my mother as a, as a Mother's Day gift. I didn't tell my mother that I was writing the book. I'm, I don't know if she connected the fact that I was doing that by the frequent phone calls and conversations about the past. 
But my mother was actually um, an advocate of the domestic violence program. She directed uh, two different programs. The last program she was with for 15 years um, and did some amazing work in the field. I gave her that book for Mother's Day and it was with every intention of honoring her as a survivor and appreciating her um, for what she gave to me and my siblings in terms of our freedom and in terms of our strength. But receiving that book was an extremely painful experience for her. Um, she kept it private. I think she felt a lot of shame um, and just great sadness around having that story documented and knowing that the story was not only hers, but that her children also had a story to tell. So after about a year of just holding that close to her chest, she started to think through it and realized that it was actually a gift that I had given her that was meant with love and admiration and gratitude. So eventually she started encouraging me to own my story and to share my story and to use it to educate others. She knew we were both doing this work in the movement to end domestic violence and she, in realizing that I had my own story to tell, um, really wanted to encourage me to do that. So I started telling parts of my story during educational events and trainings that I did uh, with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And after sharing it in these educational settings and seeing the presentation and the impact that it was having, she decided that she wanted to join me. So you'll see in this picture on the right, um, there I am with my mom and a longtime advocate, and we're able to tell our story together. Um, I reflect on you know, those pieces of the story from the perspective of a child, and she reflects on them um, from the perspective of a mother. And so um, you know, it, it can be a very meaningful presentation. And just wanting to share with you kind of how we moved from uh, you know, having this story to deciding to share it. There were some considerations for us that were unique to our experience. Um, one of them is, as a child exposed, my story was also my mother's story and my sister's story and my brother's story. So I needed to go to each of them to get their permission and support to do this publicly um, because of what it might mean for them. Um, there were also concerns about backlash from uh, my mother's abuser, although those diminished over time as, as their and there got to be more time between the time that we left him um, and the time of our presentations. Um, that kind of fear lessened and lessened. And there's managing the aftershocks of doing these presentations, both my mother's and my own, where you know after you speak about the experience, um, you have these trauma echoes that happen, and you are sitting with yourself and, and kind of thinking through. Um, all of those things that come up while you're sharing your story. So when exploring this with survivors, you can help them process, you can offer emotional support, you can help make connections to other survivors who've shared their stories um, to kind of help, help them um, build community, and you can assist them in safety planning. It's important to work with survivors to visualize a positive outcome in ways that may, may make them feel grounded and strong so that they can make decisions about which pieces to share and, and why. So one red flag to watch out for is when a survivor has an open court case. We consulted with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women and Movement Council in developing these uh, pieces of guidance, and they recommend that survivors with open court cases not share their story publicly. An open court case would include any pending legal case, such as child custody or divorce proceedings, that involve the abusive person. Survivors and advocates must be mindful that information shared by the survivor speaker could be used as evidence. So it's important to always consult legal counsel when um, when you know there's an issue around wanting to share the story when there's an open court case. So another role that advocates can play is helping survivors select content. In, prepara in preparation for the event, it's important to remember that it, it is the survivor's story. They're the one who owns it. They're the one who lived it. Um, it's theirs. Um, but it's important to suggest that they outline what they want to say. Um, one thing that can be 
really difficult. Um, there's so many emotions and so many um, feelings that surface when you're about to share your story in, from, in front of an audience. Um, it's just a nervous situation. Um, and so it's very important to write down in some form or another what you're, what you're going to say, whether it's an outline, whether it's notes, whether you're actually writing down every word that you're going to say. It helps you stay focused. Um, it helps avoid that feeling of paralysis when you're standing in front of everybody and nothing's coming to your mind. It's just very helpful. Um, and it can also be a helpful way for uh, advocates to help survivors reflect on the order of their presentation, the story that they're telling, the key points that they are wanting to make, um, what are the take-home messages for the audience. These are all important things that need to be reflected um, in the outline or the, or the notes that the survivor will use. Um, so it's helpful to, for survivors to describe the dynamics of abuse as well as what might have helped or hurt them along the way. Um, one of the things that can be the most impactful is explaining to people around the dynamics kind of what does it look like, what did it feel like, um, just painting a picture about what the survivor experience is. And then talking about how advocates may have helped along the way or hurt, how systems may have helped or hurt, how loved ones or the community, how different and influencers may have hurt or helped the situation along the way. That's really where the lessons learned come from. Um, it's important to share snapshots. Um, you'll notice that when I opened with my with my a piece of my story, it was really a snapshot into one event, which was a dinner that we were sitting down for. Um, it's less impactful to just give kind of a timeline of events where I would say in 1991 this happened, in 1992 this happened. Um, it's just it can help the audience better if you give snapshots or little pictures of glimpses into the life of um, in order to help them understand. Um, there also needs to be connections between each thread or maybe even reflections on, you know, on a particular snapshot. So I would give a snapshot and then maybe reflect on it and say, you know, at that time, uh, these are the things I was feeling. These are the challenges that I was facing. Um, these are um, the lessons that I learned or the messages I received from my abuser. These are the messages I received from my family. Um, so reflections are just as important as the story that itself. Um, and so it's all about helping listeners understand what it's like to be in survivor's shoes um, because that's something that um, only survivors can help us know. So in terms of helpful content, um, I want to share some quotes from survivor stories that really illustrate different types of helpful content. First, it's helpful when survivors identify what type of support was the most impactful. So the survivor says, what didn't help in my healing? It didn't help when people looked away and pretended the abuse wasn't happening. One of my most painful memories was when my husband was beating me in front of some of his friends and they didn't do anything to help. They just sat there in my living room watching some game on TV while my husband assaulted me. That was an extreme example, but there were others. My family and friends knew what was going on, but they didn't ever say anything to me like, you don't deserve this. So this can be a really impactful way um, for a survivor to share how um, they could be supported while they're surviving domestic violence. Second is helpful when survivors can share how systems responses impacted their path to safety and justice. The survivor says, I think you have to have people around you that know the same thing that you're going through because people don't understand. It would be nice if a social worker came with the police because when the police take your son and they handcuff him and take him out of the house, there's nobody there for you to put their arm around you and say, it's going to be all right. What can I do for you? You're left in a kind of empty situation. So again, another really helpful thing in terms of systems response. From my own story, um, I like to share something about how program responses have had the greatest impact on me in my life. For me, the most helpful thing about staying in the domestic violence shelter was the teen room. I was 12, but it felt very much like I was a grown-up, and I didn't want to engage in the children's activities, so I always resisted that. When advocates would say, come color with the other children, I would like just laugh because it was ridiculous to me. So in the teen room, 
It was a place where I found solitude. It was a, a place where I found a break from my responsibility and where I could keep up with my schoolwork and maintain that consistency. Um, there are so many reasons why the teen room was helpful, and I can point to it as you know, just a, a thing that I think programs can do to help teens that just requires very little effort and can have a very big impact. So I did um, have a video in here, and I was thinking that, depending on time, but it looks like we will have some time. So what I'm going to do is play just a couple minutes of this video. It shows several survivor stories, um, and if you you know, are finding that you don't have a survivor who's willing to share their story in person, um, another way to incorporate survivor stories into your presentations um, and events is to uh, use survivor stories that are documented in videos. This is from a video called Something So Beautiful um, by Interactive Wake County in Raleigh, North Carolina. And so I'll just play a couple minutes. Um, I would encourage you if you're having trouble hearing um, or if it's not syncing up or if you're having any other difficulty with the technology um, that you please just um, notify Christine um, and she'll let me know. Beyonce, you know, um, or uh, I guess uh, as you can say, like having like an argument and so forth. Um, she had got approval for uh, this house that she was going to um, have built, um, and they, you know they were both going to live in it, but they were doing like I guess a lot of arguments, and um, she um, she explained to him that you know that uh, you know basically with all the arguments and so forth that. It's best now that she didn't even want the house and so forth. But she was like, you know, if you still want the house, um, I can show you. She was on the computer, you know, uh, uh, just pulling up the figures and stuff to try to show him, you know, how he could, he could uh, get approved for it and so forth. And um, picked up a 29-pound wooden chair and walked over and repeatedly started beating my sister over the head with the chair, and um, just repeatedly until she finally made it outside um, to where she finally collapsed. You know, the police got there and so forth, the paramedics, and uh, we went back in the house and started cleaning up, and we got to, you know, just right Maybe it was a very good thing, you know, that uh, I, you know, I was at work and I couldn't get there in time to see her at the hospital because uh, the condition, you know, saying the way they describe, you know, and when it's your own mother describing her, her child and the condition that she was in, it was best that I didn't see her that way because. Uh, I'm not sure that I would have been able to come back to Sandy as we know it. And um, it's very hard for me every day. So, you know, it's just uh, another type of story to share, another you know, strategy for telling that story. And I think one of the things that's um, most impactful about this particular story, and there's others in this series on this video that you can look, um, I'll send the link and you can access them afterwards. Um, it's just seeing the emotion in his face as he describes that incident. Um, and also it's important to understand, you know, when a survivor is in that place, um, that we need to support them after sharing their, their story. Because the places that he was revisiting as he was talking are incredibly painful, um, incredibly traumatic. Um, and so it's just a matter of, in your role as an advocate, um, being there to help support the survivor in processing that. So different populations of survivors may have specific considerations when exploring the possibility of sharing their stories. So you've heard from me, a child exposed 
and the unique considerations when sharing my own story, including the impact on my family, and most importantly, my mother. Um, these are other specific populations who may share their stories and have other considerations that come up when they uh, consider the possibility of sharing. So victims who have been charged with or convicted of a crime, elder survivors, teens, speakers who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, male survivors, survivors uh, with disabilities, deaf or hard of hearing speakers, uh, speakers who have English as a second language, um, and also surviving family members. Um, and we do go into kind of considerations for these different populations in the guides, so you can refer to those guides for more specific guidance. I wonder um, if it might be a good time for us to stop um, and see if there's any questions coming in from the audience, um, or if you have uh, any thoughts on other populations who, for whom there may be specific considerations when sharing their stories. So I'll pause there. Um, we had one request for the full link of the video, which we will um, we'll link on the Health Path website um, along with the recording of this. Um, so far, no other questions have come in. Okay. So we'll move on to the next section of our discussion, which is around safety planning and support. So there's a number of things that we can do to help plan for survivor safety before the event occurs. First, if a survivor or speaker feels that for any reason their own safety, that of their children or their, or their loved ones will be at risk, advocates should err on the side of safety and not try to talk the survivor into speaking. Um, we really do tr uh, stress the importance of trusting survivors um, in their own instincts and their own assessment of their risk and, and their safety. Um, and so it's a matter of following the survivor's lead. Um, advocates can also help survivors identify where and how to leave out information that may put them and their families at risk. So it's another important reason why um, you know, documenting what you're going to say, planning out what you're going to say, can be particularly helpful in safety planning before the event, where advocates might um, you know, read the, the plans or the outline and be able to identify some red flags for safety um, that may put them at risk things that survivors may not have thought of. But ultimately, it is the survivor's decision whether or not to speak out um, and what to share, what not to share. Um, and all survivors are entitled to uh, privacy and protection, so it's our job to ensure that they have that. When it comes to media involvement, it's very important that survivor speakers are aware of what media outlets may be present at the event, how the information will be shared, and what the implications might be. Confidentiality issues should be discussed and agreed upon prior to any media contact. If media are going to be invited to an event, that's got to be part of the conversation. There are ways that media can document events while also protecting, protecting the confidential identity of a survivor and their family. So you'll want to explore those options um, with the media outlets who will be present um, and, you know, with, with any of those um, types of media channels. Um, also, a, a note that we you know, keep revisiting, a survivor speaker can always say no to a request for an interview. Your role as a victim advocate is to support and honor that choice uh, and help ensure that others do as well. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll take a sip. Hey, Casey, do you have um, something in either in the um, toolkit or something you can talk about right now? Um, so you, you have the event, you line everybody up, and the speaker decides not to tell their story like right before or gets partway through it and decides they can't keep going. Is there, um, what are some of the ways that the um, advocates and the people on the call can help the survivor in that situation and then also um, talk to the group that's assembled about it? 
Hmm, no, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure that I have a really good answer for you, um, but I would hope that what would happen is in the preparation leading up to the event that you would be able to explore with the survivor what all the, the possibilities are so that you don't find yourself in a situation where they're backing out at the last minute or changing their mind or saying no. I think that it, the more informed survivors are about who's going to be at the event, what will be recorded, and, and as the most involved that they can be in the decision-making process about those things, the less likelihood that that will happen. Um, but I think, you know, even if a survivor's in the middle of their story and becomes overwhelmed and decides to step away from the microphone, so to speak, um, that it's important for there to be a backup plan in place where, you know, the advocate might take the microphone and explain um, that it's a very challenging thing. And, and I think most people understand the challenges around survivors sharing their stories. Um, and, you know, perhaps there can be a backup plan in place, like um, making sure that there's some kind of, um, you know, a video to show or poetry to share or another thing that will help drive home the points that the survivor's uh, speech might have illustrated. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay. Great. And we hope that that don't, doesn't happen. So <laughs> to assist you in pre uh, with presenting framing information to the media, uh, we've developed a number of three-legged stool talking point forms, um, and they provide statistics and facts that explore domestic violence and its impact on different communities and populations. So when communicating with the media, it can be helpful to have these types of forms um, to provide when they are writing their article uh, to make sure that they're framing their story with information that you find is the most important and accurate. Um, and so if, wherever you can influence the story that's being told, it's important to do so. So there's a number of options for sharing survivor stories online. Um, there's a number of different mediums, personal blogging, guest blogging, um, being interviewed for online news stories, um, blogging, Twitter discussions, YouTube videos, Tumblr threads. There, there's a variety of options. The things that you'll want to consider uh, related to privacy, um, copyright, and content use are who owns the rights to repost or share the content published on public sites, and maybe you want to decide uh, not to share on a certain venue um, if their rights are, you know, that uh, anybody can repost or share, or that maybe the site will own that content themselves and can share it in whatever ways they want to. You'll want to consider other ways to protect survivor identity and personal space um, within that channel. And can, comment, can the comment section be disabled when you're sharing, or could it be moderated for potential backlash or victim blaming com uh, comments that may arise? So you need to help survivors consider their options to safely share and participate in online communities through social media in the same way that you would in, in an in-person event. On the day of the presentation, you should ask survivors what they might need. Um, do they need you to be there standing next to her or behind her while she speaks, to, just to be present there waiting in the wings, or to be sitting in the audience so that she can maintain eye contact with you? Um, does she need to have time for discussion and practice? Um, does, she, does he or she want to go through it, um, you know, before the event happens? Um, it may also be helpful to decide on a signal or a code word that would help you indicate distress. Um, where advocates could be uh, helpful by assisting or interrupting the presentation or allowing for a pause or a break or, you know, whatever might be needed at the time. When it comes to audience questions, you really need to decide in advance whether the survivor will take questions and how. Um, maybe somebody will uh, field the questions for the survivor. Um, you also need to prepare for victim-blaming comments and, and how those questions will be addressed. It might be helpful to consider the possibility of a panel of survivor speakers um, where you would have a group of survivors there to support each other and to step in for each other um, when, things, when and if things get difficult. For me, in sharing my story, the attacks on my mother and her choices are especially painful to hear from the audience. Things like, why did she stay? Things like, how could she let that happen to you? 
just really diminish the fact that she did survive, that she did protect us, and that she did ultimately escape and um, find safety and freedom. But the questions, the judgment, and the general reactions from the audience can be especially difficult to navigate. It's important to help survivors understand what to expect in this regard, and perhaps to offer counter messages to help offset that impact. I know for me, one of the most difficult audiences to address is um, those who work in uh, child protection or child welfare, because um, we often have, sometimes do not have a shared definition of um, child abuse or child neglect um, and child exposure to domestic violence. And so a lot of times those um, different understandings can impact um, the way that people working in that field might perceive my story and my experience. And so that would be just one example of if you were preparing a child witness to domestic violence to speak in front of an audience like that, um, it may be helpful to think through what kinds of um, understanding that audience may have about domestic violence, um, how they think about it, what is their role, and what, what do they do as part of their work, and what is their responsibility. Um, and helping a survivor understand all of that can also help them better feel better equipped to respond to them when those questions come up. Um, but yes, it may be that the advocate decides to step in and field those questions. So there are several techniques that survivors can use to help ground themselves during their presentation, and these are things that um, advocates should, should surely share um, around breathing, around centering. I know that one of the things I always learned about public speaking was around pacing yourself and around slowing your pace. Um, and that may feel uncomfortable to people who aren't used to sharing their story, but it often results in having a greater impact when you're able to slow your pace um, and just really focus on the words you're saying and not rush through. Um, there's calming self-talk that we can do. Um, maybe you want to hold, you know, some kind of sensory object um, or think of that mantra in your head. Um, there's a number of things um, in preparation of the event, uh, writing a letter to yourself. Maybe you want to write yourself a letter about how proud you are of yourself um, as a survivor. Uh, write it to yourself before the event, and then after the event, read your letter. Um, it can help you come full circle um, back to a, a helpful, healing, resilient place. So there's a number of things um, that we can do to help ensure a survivor's safety at the event. You can connect with the survivor with uh, any law enforcement or security if they're going to be present. If there is an order of protection in place, you'll want to make sure you share copies with those who um, it would be helpful for them to have that. You'll want to alert the staff or law enforcement if the abuser is known to carry or have access to a weapon. That's all related to risk assessment. And you'll want to have a signal or code word to alert staff or law enforcement of suspected danger. Um, you'll want to familiarize the survivor speaker with emergency exits, where to hide if they need to hide, and what the quickest route is to leave the property. Again, these are all considerations to explore with the survivor based on their assessment of the potential risk. Um, you want to consider whether the abuser or their people might be present at the event and plan for survivor safety from any heckling, badgering, threats, or other kinds of intimidation or abuse that may happen. And those may not come only from the uh, family or friends of the, of the abuser. They may also just come from uninformed people in the community. So during the event, there's other things. Um, if survivors uh, anticipate that the event may become dangerous for them, um, they can keep things handy in case of emergency cell phone, car keys, backpack, medication, uh, close. Um, they can always bring a support, uh, support people with them to the event, uh, whether that's a coworker, family member, friend. Um, and it sometimes it's a helpful strategy for survivors to bring a friend and then talk to that friend in the audience. It can be a helpful way to get through uh, the presentation um, while keeping an eye on somebody who you know is supporting you 100%. Um, and again, 
think and visualize where to go, what path is best to, to take. Above all, they must trust their instincts. If anyone feels unsafe or an eerie feeling of unease sets in, act on it um, because safety is the most important thing. The after can sometimes be the most difficult part for survivor speakers. Um, it's important to think about how the survivor speaker may want to interact with audience members, and we talked about that. Um, escorting the survivor speaker as they leave the location um, can be uh, an important strategy. Um, accompanying into their car, making sure they're safe, and then scheduling periodic check-in calls afterwards um, to see how they're doing, how they're processing the event, and, and, and how the aftermath is for them. For me, the aftermath of sharing my story seems much more difficult than the sharing itself. When I'm sharing my story, I'm typically surrounded by supportive people, people who are mostly rooting for me, um, and I'm in it, I'm doing it, so I'm not thinking about it as much when I'm actually speaking. But afterwards, I'm just alone with my sadness and my vulnerability, and that can be, that can feel like a very dark place. You'll also want to be sure to show appreciation You'll want to provide ongoing support, and if at all possible, really do offer compensation for the survivor um, to show that they are valuable. Um, you know, that's one of the ways in our culture we show um, how valuable uh, a person or their time is, and so it's important to reflect that with compensation. So within three to five days of the speaking event, you'll want to talk to the survivor and ask, has the abuser resumed any unwanted contact? contact? Have there been any repercussions like new threats um, or different behaviors um, from compared to before the event that might raise safety concerns? Um, and you can offer assistance related to those. Um, you'll want to respect any boundaries with regard to ongoing contact or future requests to be a guest speaker, you want to check in and say how was that for you and is it something you would consider doing again. And again, um, you'll want to make sure they're compensated. And for longer events, you'll also want to consider covering their meals, their childcare, their travel expenses, things like that. So you'll want to um, help survivors have a self-care plan for after the event. Um, that prioritizes treating themselves gently and with care following the event um, so that maybe they can avoid some of the darkness that may follow. Um, allow time for reflection and processing, either by journaling or counseling or other strategies. Um, and it's true, many survivors engage in healing self-care activities after retelling their story. I know for me, um, I used to fill up my schedule and, you know, I would be back to work immediately following a presentation. Now I know that I need a little time off and I need to be able to focus my energy in some other healthy place um, before I can return to work. So I'm going to... Um, begin to close, begin to wrap up, um, and so I want to pause here and see if any additional questions have come in, Christine. Um, the only thing that did come in was Bonnie um, Wilson uh, up in the Northeast said that she had a speaker at their Unity Day event start their story and stop because they were overcome. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they, they were able to, you know, let the audience know that, you know, we welcome the opportunity to purge the ugliness, and sometimes those feelings are just very painful. And it was a very powerful um, event. So having her start her story and then stop actually became a very powerful um, demonstration to the audience. So. Well, that's so wonderful. And really, Christine addresses the question you asked earlier, um, which is such a perfect way to do it, is to just sit and reflect on, um, you know, if, if something goes awry or if the speaker decides not to continue, reflect on that specifically, just how much strength and how much courage it takes to even stand up in front of the microphone, let alone to open your mouth and speak, and um, yes, to really reflect on and value um, survivors um, and their experiences. I think that that's incredibly powerful, and I so appreciate that, Bonnie. Were there anything, was there anything else that came in? Uh, no, nothing else has come in. Okay, wonderful. So I want to start closing by just sharing this um, brief video um, that we co-branded with No More. And I understand that similar efforts are happening in communities um, 
so uh, around you. So let me just play this, and we'll. Well, she was drunk. Boys will be boys. I'm sure they'll work it out. You warned her. She was asking for it. Why doesn't she just leave? It's time to end domestic violence and sexual assault. So again, the No More campaign just really illustrates, um, you know, misperceptions around domestic and sexual violence, responses that survivors are used to receiving, and I think for me really drives the point home about just how um, scary it is to share your story when all of these common perceptions about survivors exist, but to stand up in the face of that and do it, it just takes tremendous courage um, and hopefully will help to change the national dialogue around domestic and sexual violence in a positive way. So as Christine mentioned, there's um, two additional webinars coming up. Uh, one with a focus on uh, Arabic and Muslim communities and one with a focus on Hispanic and Latino communities uh, related to sharing survivor stories. Um, and there's the dates and times of those to get on your calendar. Um, and also I want everyone to know the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence is available. We offer free technical assistance training and resource materials. Um, and so you should please feel free to contact us for additional information or resources. Um, I'm happy to talk with anybody um, as a follow-up to this. And we will be sending out some resources and links um, after the close of this session. So thank you very much.